I will I will not take up too much of your time. I mean, I I posted two extremely different videos for you as a uh, way into this uh, and I I have no illusions that you would understand everything that was being said in the or, or communicated in the uh, in the um, mashup of the uprisings in in Maputo but I wanted you to just get a graphic sense of of what happened and also for you to notice for instance that this is not just young disgruntled men who protest in the street this is the classical image of protest these were also middle-aged middle-aged women mothers elderly you had security guards who who sort of suddenly switched you also had at at in certain elements policemen taking parts in these protests yeah? so the, it was a very uh, heterogeneous kind of uh, kind of group and then you have, and this is of course a bit unfair towards uh, Teresa Caldera perhaps, then you have uh, the video of her sitting and discussing uh, the, the kind of potentials of new collectives in the, in the global south. And I, I wanted to juxtapose those uh, because this is, one is kind of what goes on on the ground in a dirt poor country like Mozambique where people actually organize and this is how it, how it looks. And then you have the more uh, scholarly level, in a sense, of what collectivity is. So I want you to reflect a bit on what is collectivity, empirically and analytically, in a sense. Yeah? Uh, and what does and can citizenship mean in contexts like Mozambique and elsewhere, in your context, of course? And how may we, if we want to think about transformation and, uh, and uh, have a future orientation and also to bring in the notion of, of uh, the climate change and, and, and these issues that are central to, to this module, how can we as researchers tap into these energies uh, that we see? Uh, is it possible? What kind of violence epistemologically do we bring if we tap into these energies in a sense to be a bit provocative and what is as Asun said in her opening lectures she talked about the need for actionable knowledge yeah? actionable knowledge how can we think about these collectivities in terms of actionable knowledge are they useful at all? Should they just be educated, put into schools and courses? Should we just subsume them to, to the discipline of NGOs, you know, educating them to behave nicely? Or what can we learn from them? Okay. Okay, I think I'll, 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 I'll um, stop there if there are no sort of just very quick questions about the video from Mozambique that no one know of you that, that, that is sort of central to, 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 to understand before discussing. No? Okay. Then, as I understand it, we break into 15, is it 15 minutes, Sid? Yeah, 15 minute uh, things and then we... We're all back. So, uh, yeah, uh, we now we would now like to hear the verdict of the jury. The the one group, group group four, was it? Yes. Yeah. Hello. So, um, should I start by? Um, providing our insights of our discussion. Okay, um, well, I can uh, give a general um, overview of our main uh, points. Um, it's uh, probably a mixture of uh, three questions that prompt our discussion. Um, but uh, since we're talking about uh, social movements, um, we have seen through past and recent experiences that um, researchers and academia have been evolving their research uh, work, adapting to the new changes of the social um, movements. Uh, for example, we just mentioned um, the past the movement of the like, Black Lives Matter, in which um, 
of the, um, the new social circumstances forces um, academia to evaluate the scope of the research and formulate uh, new, um, uh, new frameworks. The same happened as well with the pandemic right now with the COVID-19 that we are living through. That, uh, there was no way uh, this phenomenon could have been foreseen or forecast. Uh, that's why um, it had to be somehow reframe and adapt to new circumstances. So we currently see researchers trying to take uh, some kind of framework from these um, movements, from these uh, situations, and try to adapt to future circumstances. Um, so that way, this interdisciplinarity from research has to work together and put new knowledge into action, trying to, well, not forecast, but uh, somehow uh, create a framework for future research. Um, of course, both sides, meaning academia and um, social citizens, social movements together, they build up this new urban transformation for a hopefully future, better, sustainable uh, way of living. So uh, probably that's what I could uh, start by saying from our discussion. I don't know if the rest of my team would like to point out something I missed. Maybe I can just add one thing um, in relation to question two, um, uh, which is more like a barrier that we identified in that regard, um, in that in some countries um, where I guess the state is potentially um, part of the oppressive regime uh, and universities are part of the state system, um, academics don't have the freedom to um, to freely engage and um, share the learnings from the collectives that that emerge. If I could just add to that, thank you, thank you for this uh, opening. Uh, if I could just add to that uh, last point, I think this is hugely important. Uh, uh, academics and researchers <clears throat> are not a universally positioned group, neither sort of systemically, uh, as Katinka pointed out. Uh, in some places, universities are part of the state structures, which are part of the oppressive regime, or part of the welfare state, or part of a neoliberal sovereignty, or what have you. And in some places, they're private. In some places, they're also extremely precarious institutions that are on the margins of the state, or on the margins of society, and are uh, often uh, attempted disciplined and the researchers in them are attempted disciplines. On top of that, you have, I think we have to recognize, you have a um, global uh, plurality of epistemologies, yeah? uh, knowledge systems, ways of producing knowledge, ways of doing research around the world, which makes us uh, which should make us humble to 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 diversity in in research as well, and to to uh, which positions people speak from and what problems they speak to. Yeah, so I just wanted to 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 mention that. Can can I ask you in that regard? Do you think we are humble, the academics? In that oh. Yeah, well, you ask me that after I've been blabbering my mouth off of how things are in Mozambique for, for 45 minutes. So, yeah, no, no, not necessarily. I think we're not humble enough. I think we need to be uh, more humble. I think we need to take uh, on board uh, those of us who, who work in the places where we not ourselves live. We need to take on board uh, knowledge production and the lived in realities in places where we do engage. Yeah? 
specifically, I'm thinking here about sort of the northern researchers going to the so-called southern hemisphere, et cetera, et cetera. That is extremely important, I think. I think the days are gone when when one could uh, sit at privileged northern Euro universities and and uh, and come to big conclusions about how things really are down there in a sense yeah so we should be more humble i totally i totally agree and i i therefore really appreciate uh, work being done in this regard um uh, and since you're from South Africa, I can mention, mention the work uh, of uh, Francis Nyamjo, for instance, which I really appreciate, and uh, Divine Fu, and, uh, and Sabelo Nodlovo Gacheni, uh, who do uh, extremely important work in terms of, of sensitizing us to, to, to other epistemologies and other traditions of doing research, I think. Does anyone want to venture into the terrain of collectivities? What are, what are, uh, how should I put it? What are um, useful ways for researchers uh, like us, like we all are here, to think about collectivities uh, these days? I mean, we have a we have a number of alternatives. We can call them like Hart and Negri. You know, uh, there are multitudes. We can call them crowds, like Mazzarella and a, and a, a long history of of uh, research into populism. Uh, we can call them insurgent citizens if we think about sort of the engaged urban people, like like James Holston. We can go Marxists and call them classes information or classes. I mean, there are a number of ways in which we can approach these, but what, what from your perspective would be useful when you think about not necessarily only the theme of what we've been talking about today, about protests, but uh, more generally about inequality and engaging urban inequalities for transformation. Uh, can I can I put an, an input on on this? Um, maybe coming from a background that collectivity and citizenship has been uh, buzzing keywords for the past few years. Uh, I come from from Egypt, from Cairo, uh, uh, more specifically. So these have been um, keywords that have been used uh, numerous times uh, in 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 my lifetime and then historically again. Um, for, 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 for me and what I've been uh, talking with my group about is that a collectivity um, is a group of people that are uh, having similar uh, mindsets uh, in a way. Uh, so they require, they are working towards a vision or are requiring a certain uh, thing to be uh, implemented. Um, but then this collectivity uh, can be different. Um, so it might have uh, a good brain and organization behind it uh, to achieve its uh, goals. And uh, in some other cases, like in the case of Maputo, it did not. So although they did have some um, short-term uh, successes, on the long term, it did not eventually lead to uh, a more inclusive environment or um, a higher uh, degree of uh, interventions by the people in the political system. Um, this is actually similar uh, to, to my experience in, in a little bit or, or my, what I've seen as, as a citizen. Um, so in, in, in this regard, collectivity and citizenships uh, to be used by researchers is, is very hard. It needs actually um, 
a, a very good uh, interaction with the people uh, that we are targeting to, to know what we can, should do with this collectivity uh, and respond to it in, uh, in a certain way. Um, in the US, for example, I think it's a little bit different because now it is going uh, in a larger scale. So the collectivity is showing um, on a wider scale than uh, on what happened in Mozambique or in my experience here. Um, so there is no one um, scenario fits all. It's a case by case basis, more or less. Um, maybe adding to this, uh, we also discussed that uh, collectivities can maybe also within themselves be um, some, somehow differentiated that you have uh, in, in a movement like, or I don't know if you can call it a movement, but overall protests uh, that uh, relate to Black Lives Matter, you will also have very different forms of collectivity, some, some rather spontaneous and eruptive forms of protest and they're there with their forms of organization and some much more institutionalized structures that um, that maybe uh, persist way beyond uh, the, the protests. And I think they're on the one hand, they form a larger collective and a larger shared opinion. And on the other hand, there are also smaller collectives within, within this broader uh, aim maybe. does it make sense yeah it makes it makes a uh, very good sense and i i i appreciate both uh both comments uh um it i mean there are examples of spontaneous collectivities like the the uprisings in maputo that that make a huge change in the sense of of transforming the whole city but it's it's only for a certain time and then it recedes and what and and the big question is what happens to that energy in a sense and yeah? what happens to that engagement where does it where does it go it's not channeled channeled into into stable political institutions in a sense yeah so so what how can we how can we approach that and i think uh, lucas had a point when he says that they're, 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 i mean any collectivity has this sort of tension between between stability and institutionalization versus spontaneity yeah so and this is a, this is a, this is a problem and 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 uh, and uh, Esra, i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing your your name correctly and i, I probably am i'm not okay <laughs> okay thank you a shot in the dark but uh, yeah thank you no uh, i think i think you're you're very right i mean and and this was precisely my point we have to look at these collectivities within their contexts yeah? we cannot really assume a priori that we know what these things uh, are what the, what the what the drivers are behind them in a sense yeah and and just to add a small note not trying to 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 kill the discussion but i in in the break i i mentioned to sid and devin that um if you don't really understand the socialist history of mozambique it is very very hard to understand how and why people mobilized and and how and why people used the slogans they did because the socialist trajectory has uh in a sense um uh contributed very significant significantly to what you could call the political cosmology of of people in maputo yeah so they don't have the kind of classic liberal notion of citizenship that we do necessarily when they engage yeah and this will vary very much across the globe of course yeah so collectivities necessarily need in my opinion to be uh, approached openly yeah, as something we don't necessarily know the contents of and we should be again a bit humble when 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 trying to make sense of them and and why people engage the way they do i may just wanted to to chip in on um i was reminded of this uh, with esra's uh, comment that one column I've loved reading in a magazine called The New Internationalist 
um, every month is uh, is called Letters from Cairo, and uh, it features different uh, uh, writers who've uh, been long term residents of Cairo who who express understandings of the city from their vantage points. Now I'm wondering, um, you know, one cannot easily claim that what they're representing is a collectivity. Sometimes it can be quite a, a an unusual perspective, but being able to platform a particular imagining of the city, um, being able to stake those claims in different fora, I feel that's part of actually working towards collectivities. And so um, that's just one example, but I guess to me, it seems like the dynamism here is is in that contestation of different collectivities, each taking their claim to be sort of purposively able to mobilize particular kinds of transformation in the city. Let's say maybe this is somewhat linked with the third question. But I was curious if others uh, talked about this to and fro movement of what expression we, we see and what actually comes into being. Um, I was I was thinking about what uh, about my own research in the in the energy sector and what notions of, of collectivity we we use there and and there's recently there's a lot of buzz about the notion of community and community energy energy cooperatives you know citizen energy movements or whatever and and. To, well, it's 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 become such a buzz that this can mean basically anything now. So it can mean an energy cooperative, it can mean a community benefit fund, or or or, or basically if you just you have some little amount of money that you invest in a in a wind farm or solar park, you automatically sort of become part of the community. And I don't think that this is actually well. This is not how communities work, and this is this is not what you would usually mean mean by a community. And a lot of the times, these these notions of collectivity are are used to to maybe to you know symbolically get people on board and to oppress uh, some some other kinds of collectivity like protest or resistance or some 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 forms that are trying to bring about more radical change or, or, or use different means to, to bring about change. So, uh, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for that. That's a very helpful, uh, helpful uh, comment. I think. I mean, because I mean, we have a, we of course have a, as researchers, we have a problem. Yeah, we are, well, we have many problems. But one of the problems we we have is that we sometimes use the same terms analytically. Uh, as uh, as terms that are used both by people themselves and various forms of collectivities, and also terms that are used in in hegemonic or non hegemonic discourses, yeah. Like and 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 the notion of community is of course one of the one of the most prevalent ones. Yeah? This is used in everything from corporate communication to state discourses to uh, would-be representatives of that type of locality itself, in a sense. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and then you have to spend a lot of time trying to, to, uh, to say what you mean as a researcher by community uh, in contrast to the, to, the, to the corporate interest or contrast to hegemonic discourses and perhaps in contrast also to the local would-be leader of that type of locality as well. So, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a general problem, I think. If I might add um, another further comment regarding uh, my previous example of my uh, question on the um, one hour ago, is that uh, regarding also with the concept of collectivity and in our country, for example, this collectivity tends to disguise or misleads um, a, a movement in the sense of, as I mentioned, there are uh, so many demonstrations, but the people are so tired of them 
and the government is paying every time less attention to it. Then when you see a bunch of thousands of people, you start wondering if it's a legitimate movement. You cannot now distinguish if it was kind of a paid movement, meaning uh, there is someone else uh, like um, um, internal um, cooperatives leaders that is collecting, is trying to push people out on the streets to demonstrate for not real causes, although it seems the opposite. And uh, once you have these true social movements uh, that contrast with these thousands of people that are going there on the streets, causing riots, closing highways, it, it is really difficult to distinguish one from the other. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, there are some, uh, you have to not trust, but the, it, nowadays it seems that social media is capturing how uh, uh, the consequences or how after this movement has taken place, uh, this effervescence, how long does it take to evaporate? So it's really difficult in our case to find um, an effort to distinguish one from the other and which one is real or which one it has a, a, a permanent effect on um, governments. So it's also related not only to the concept or collectivity, but also on the consequences of, of it. Perhaps we could try to open the floor for those who haven't contributed yet, reflecting on, on pa Patricia's comment and, and the other things that have been said. If anyone else would like to chip in. May I? Yes. Um, so I, um, I wrote my master's thesis on the Umbrella Revolution in Hong Kong. And, uh, and this, is, this is just my understanding of it, but one, one, one um, insight that I made was that uh, you, you cannot really, um, how to say, uh, orchestrate a movement. Uh, I mean, there is always an agenda, but uh, there are also other factors influ influencing the, the movement, uh, such as um, such as um, uh, if you if you take the Black Lives Matter as an example, there was the event of uh, of the what's his name, um, the killing. Um, Floyd. Yeah, that sort of uh, ignited the the whole movement and there there must also be um, uh, like a, a, a zeitgeist um, so I, I guess my my understanding is that uh, um, I, I mean in terms of uh, starting a, a, a movement for for uh, sustainable transitions it, it cannot happen just by just by having an agenda um, uh, there, there must also be uh, there, there are because there are also other factors uh, for um, sort of creating a, a momentum uh, and then they they can they 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 happen more by chance or by, um, you know, just just randomly. Um, so, I mean, I, I still think it's important to to study movements, but I'm not sure that we can uh, use them to, to we we can we can study them to understand them as an historical context, but not to 
uh, learn from them to to be able to to ut utilize that knowledge uh, knowledge in the future. I hope that that made sense. Yeah, to to me it makes sense, but it also uh, and it's a very good reflection. I think. I mean, it 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 adds to to uh, to the very crudely put question that I put, uh, tap into the energies of, yeah? I mean, uh, the, the limits of sort of instrumentalization of, of this, because there's a lot of talk and a lot of huff and puff in especially the development world and also in some of the climate change literature that I've been looking at about sort of uh, being, uh, working with communities or working with concerns etc cetera, etc cetera. but i mean what are the limits of instrumentalization of of of, uh, of that i think it's it's important yeah i'm not sure how 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 long are we going on for now uh, Sid? i mean is this uh, are we reaching uh, reaching the end or is this uh, we're uh, we're at the close of this session. If there are okay. no more burning questions, perhaps we should have a end of the session uh, vote on 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 which video you like the best, with a with a with a thumbs up or thumbs down. <laughs> no, I'm joking. We shouldn't have that. We have um, we have a tradition um, <laughs> started this week that we applaud each of our lecturers and uh, Bjorn will unfortunately have to leave us for the, um, the video discussion. So I suggest that we uh, unmute and give him a round of applause for really, yeah.